Good morning and welcome to Worship with the People and Friends of Living Water Lutheran Church in Centerville, Ohio. It's the 18th Sunday after Pentecost. It's October 4, 2020. I'm glad you're here with us for worship and here are today's announcements. We're going to have another in-person outdoor worship gathering on Sunday, October 18 at 10 a.m. It will once again be at the North Park in Springboro. We will be uh, receiving Holy Communion during the service as we did in September. At that time, we'll also be receiving your offerings of cleaning products for uh, the ministry uh, of which we're very proud to be a part, the Life Enrichment Center. You can find details on what products are needed in the wave. I hope that you can be there, and as I said last week, pray for good weather. Remember that our weeknight Bible study takes place every night at 9 p.m. on Facebook, Monday through Friday. You can also find the studies on my blog, the address of which is markdaniels.blogspot.com. Tonight at 6 o'clock p.m., once again, uh, on the Living Water YouTube channel, you can partake of a Holy Communion. Prepare your bread and wine or grape juice in advance there at home, and then together we'll receive Christ's body and blood. I want to say uh, again a special word of thanks to all of you for your continued commitment to Christ and our congregation in these challenging times. I look forward to the day when we're able to to worship in person regularly on Sunday mornings together. In the meantime, your participation in online worship, in various small group ministries, in youth, children's, and family activities, and your faithful giving all bear witness to the strength of your faith in Christ and the strength of this congregation. Neither the devil nor the world nor our sinful selves can overpower disciples who turn in daily repentance and faith to Jesus Christ. As your pastor, I just want you to know that you all inspire me, and I deeply appreciate your faith in Christ more than I can say. And now let's worship together, beginning with the order for confession and forgiveness. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin, and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. By what we have done, and by what we have left undone, we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God in his mercy has given his Son to die for us and for his sake forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And now I ask you to join me in the Kyrie eleison. Lord have mercy. 
In response to each of the petitions I offer, I ask you to say the words and pray the words, Lord, have mercy. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For Christ's holy church, and for all members of his body who offer him their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. We now read responsively Psalm 80, verses 7 to 19. I'll read the odd verses, and I ask you to respond by reading the even verses. Restore us, God Almighty. Make your face shine on us, that we may be saved. You transplanted a vine from Egypt. You drove out the nations and planted it. You cleared the ground for it, and it took root and filled the land. The mountains were covered with its shade, the mighty cedars with its branches. Its branches reached as far as the sea, its shoots as far as the river. Why have you broken down its walls so that all who pass by pick its grapes? Boars from the forest ravage it, and insects from the fields feed on it. Return to us, God Almighty. Look down from heaven and see. Watch over this vine, the root your hand has planted, the sun you have saved up for yourself. Your vine is cut down. It is burned with fire. At your rebuke, your people perish. Let your hand rest on the man man at your right hand, the son of man you have raised up for yourself. Then we will not turn away from you. Revive us, and we will call on your name. Restore us, Lord God Almighty. Make your face shine on us, that we may be saved. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, in holy baptism, you have grafted us onto the vine that is Christ and given us a share of his inheritance that we might know the power of his resurrection. Guide us by your Holy Spirit that we might live in newness of life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our first lesson comes to us from the book of Isaiah, chapter 5, verses 1 through 7. I will sing for the one I love a song about his vineyard. My loved one had a vineyard on a fertile hillside. He dug it up and cleared it of stones and planted it with the choicest vines. He built a watchtower in it and cut out a, a wine press as well. Then he looked for a crop of good grapes, but it yielded only bad fruit. Now you dwellers in Jerusalem and people of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more could have been done for my vineyard than I have done for it? When I looked for good grapes, why did it yield only bad? Now I will tell you what I am going to do to my vineyard. I will take away its hedge, and it will be destroyed. I will break down its walls, and it will be trampled. I will make it a wasteland, neither pruned nor cultivated, and briars and thorns will grow there. I will command the clouds not to rain on it. The vineyard of the Lord Almighty is the nation of Israel, and the people of Judah are the vines he delighted in. And he looked for justice, but saw bloodshed, for righteousness, but heard cries of distress. Our second lesson comes to us from the book of Philippians, chapter 3, verses 4b through 14. Though I myself have reasons for such confidence, if someone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee. As for zeal, persecuting the church, as for righteousness, 
based on the law, faultless. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained all this, or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Our gospel lesson comes to us from the book of Matthew, chapter 21, verses 33 through 46. Listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard. He put a wall around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and moved to another place. When the harvest time approached, he sent his servants to the tenants to collect his fruit. The tenants seized his servants. They beat one, killed another, and stoned a third. Then he sent other servants to them, more than the first time, and the tenants treated them the same way. Last of all, he sent his son to them. They will respect my son, he said. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to each other, This is the heir. Come, let's kill him and take his inheritance. So they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to to those tenants? He will bring those wretches to a wretched end, they replied. And he will rent the vineyard to other tenants, who will give him his share of the crop at harvest time. Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the scriptures the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone? The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people who will produce its fruit. Anyone who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces. Anyone on whom it falls will be crushed. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard Jesus' parables, they knew he was talking about them. They looked for a way to arrest him, but they were afraid of the crowd because the people held that he was a prophet.
Let's pray. Father, in this season after Pentecost, we are challenged to grow in our faith, to grow in our dependence on you. We pray, Lord, that as we look at two of today's lessons, we will not only be challenged to do that, but by the power of your word, you will bring that growth to us, that you will help us to be more faithful disciples as we learn what it is to be transformed by you and you alone. Use these words to bring you honor and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. A woman I knew was hurt in a serious accident. When I arrived at the hospital, her life was in the balance. Her husband and other family members were all there. We prayed, and then it seemed that we sat in silence for a long time. The woman was a devoted church member and had served in positions of service and leadership at the congregation. She was what people would call a good Christian, yet it had not exempted her from her accident. After a while, her husband broke our silence in the ER waiting room to ask, how could God have let this happen? Baptized believers in Jesus Christ know that all of life and this world in which we live are undeserved gifts. King David speaks for all believers when he says in Psalm 24, verse 1, The earth is the Lord's, and everything in the world, and all who live in it. We also know that the new life we receive by faith in the Savior Jesus, who comes to us today in word and sacrament, is also a gift. We know that Jesus, God the Son, bought us out of slavery to sin and death through his crucifixion and raises us to eternal life with God through the power of his resurrection. We agree with St. Paul when he says, You were not your own. You were bought at a price. Despite the truth we know, though, about our dependence on God for both our earthly and eternal lives, deep down in our sinful natures, we suspect that we are entitled to God's blessings, just as the husband was saying in the ER when he asked how God could have let the accident happen to his Christian wife. Even unbelievers who live outwardly good lives think that their good behavior merits them exemption from the horrors that are part of life in a world fallen into sin and death. The parable that Jesus tells today is part of his contentious confrontation with the chief priests, elders, and Pharisees at the temple the day after his Palm Sunday entrance into Jerusalem and his cleansing of the temple. These people went to Jesus to ask him by what authority he was doing the things that he was doing. What entitled him to walk into the temple devoted to the Lord God as though it was his? They asked this because they believed that due to all they did for God, and because of their upright lives, they're entitled to be in, charged, in charge. How often do you and I feel exactly the same way? How often do we think that God owes us something in exchange for being Christians? To set us straight, Jesus tells a parable about a wealthy master who plants a vineyard and provides a fence, a wine press, and a tower, all the things necessary to make a vineyard successful. Then he leases the vineyard to tenants who, at harvest time, would give a portion of the fruit to him. 
The image of God's people as God's vineyard would have been familiar to Jesus' first hearers. Isaiah 5, for example, talks about God as the one who had a vineyard on a fertile hillside. Isaiah goes on to say that God, the owner of the, of, of the vineyard, the vineyard being the people of God, and Jesus being the Lord of the people he had once delivered from slavery in Egypt, did everything necessary for his people to experience life graced by him. God had expected that in his vineyard, his people would act with justice and righteousness. Instead, they walked away from God and treated the poor, the refugee, the widowed, and the orphaned with contempt. And so Isaiah says, God decided to turn ancient Israel into a wasteland, which is exactly what happened. The vineyard image then would have made Jesus' first hearers uncomfortable. As citizens of his current vineyard, it should make us feel uncomfortable too. In his parable, Jesus goes on to tell the story of ancient Israel. The master, clearly representing God, sends servants, stand-ins for God's prophets and preachers of his word, to call the tenants to repentance, to an acknowledgement of the master's authority over their lives. Finally, Jesus says the master decides to send his son, symbolizing Jesus himself. They'll listen to him, the master thinks. The people of my vineyard, will understand that they're not entitled to the blessings I freely give to them by grace and acknowledge me as the master of the vineyard. But in Jesus' parable, the people of the vineyard, like the people of ancient Israel, decide to kill the son. Why? Because they preferred living and dying with the lie that they were entitled to be in charge, to living in the truth that everything they had or every good thing they ever could have was a gift from the Master. And Jesus says effectively, this is you. This is you, chief priests, elders, Pharisees, and this is you, he says to us. Anytime you think that God owes you anything, even your salvation, you are the ungrateful and violent tenants. In our second lesson, Philippians chapter 3, verses 4 to 14, the Apostle Paul writes to first century Christians, tempted as we are to think that our life with Christ and the blessings of God are the entitlements for good people rather than free gifts of grace to people who don't deserve them. Paul recalls how, as a Pharisee, he had once felt entitled, like those who confronted Jesus on the Monday of Holy Week. If someone else thinks they have reason to put confidence in the flesh, Paul writes, that is, if anyone has reason to be confident in their entitlement to God's favor, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. Paul, in other words, was a good Jew. And he says, in regard to the law, a Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for righteousness based on the law, faultless. That last phrase is telling. Paul was saying that as far as all the outward signs of being a good religious person, worthy of God's grace and favor, he was faultless. He did everything he was supposed to. He reminds me of the man we knew who left his wife for another woman 
and when his wife asked him why, he replied, I was tired of being perfect. His wife took that in and told him, Don't worry, you weren't. Neither was Paul. Neither were the chief priests and the elders and the Pharisees. Neither are you and me. Blessedly, eternal life with God, to which you and I are not entitled, and everlasting salvation from the fires of hell to which we are entitled. Don't come to those who are perfect. Don't come to those who rely on their goodness or religiosity. Freedom from sin and death and hell come to those who acknowledge the authority of the master of the vineyard, the Lord of heaven and earth, the God who on the cross bears all our sin and sorrow and then rises from the dead so that he can give us an everlasting grace he freely gives to those who don't deserve it. That's why Paul goes on to write in Philippians, but whatever were gains to me from living by a law that he thought entitled him to life with God, but whatever gains were to me, he said, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ my Lord for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. Friends, the law of this world tells us that you need to work to be entitled to God's forgiveness and everlasting life with God. Christ tells us through his innocent suffering and death and his resurrection that he gives these blessings and so much more as free gifts of grace to those who trust in him, who hear his word and hear his call to repentance and new life and turn to him in surrender. When we live out the truth of God's grace rather than the lie of our entitlement, we can face anything in this life, trials, temptations, suffering, even a season of exile from in-person worship, as generations of Christians before us did in the face of of similar plagues to the one we face today. And when we live in the grace that God gives in Christ, we also live in the certainty that God has prepared a place for us in eternity that nobody and nothing can take from us. Never trust in yourself. Always trust in Christ. This is the way of life with God. Amen. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Heavenly Father, strengthen and sustain all congregations who gather around your word and sacrament and venture into the world to bring the good news of your redemption to all. May we be humble in our serving counting all as loss which we do for ourselves, and all as gain that Christ does in our lives. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord of the Church, we thank you for blessing and, and being with this congregation throughout the pandemic, for keeping us united and strong in you, and for sustaining us in the living hope you give through word and sacrament. We thank you for all the ways in which you allow us to meet together even when we can't meet in person. Bless your whole church on earth. Encourage our North American Lutheran Church Bishop, Dan Selbo, and our District Dean, Paul Schultz. Help your whole church 
and living water to remain focused on our one and only mission, being and making disciples. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord of creation, may the fields yield a fruitful harvest and bring forth an abundance so that all may find sustenance from the bounty of the earth. Feed those around the world that have little or nothing to eat. Provide assistance to teach people to grow food and feed their children. Make us generous to all who are hungry. Let us pray to the Lord. Heavenly Father, we pray for all who suffer with illness or pain. We lift up to you for healing all who are suffering from COVID-19, including President Trump, his wife Melania, all those who work at the White House, whether as aides or journalists, U.S. Senators, and others in the government. We pray that you will bring an end to this pandemic and help us to be vigilant and patient in doing those things we know can help mitigate its spread. We pray for your healing too, for Nancy Weish, Alan Wingo, John Wingo, Alicia, Dave Agee, Rob Miller, Bruce, Amy, Abigail Lesman, Joe Gravman, Shirley Parsons, George Ann Smith, Andrew Rogers, Barbara Bankner, John Bradoski, Linda Spangler, Betsy Keys, Gladys Fuller, Claire Shaning, Roger Rhodes, Jean Poor, John Collins, Lynn Collins, Jane Griffith, Eric Walker, Bob Scoville, Bob Atkins, Bill Wood, Danny Turner, Lexi, Jim Connerty, Laura Clark, Brody Braden, Steve Scoville, Shannon Harrison, Jamise Reeves, Gillian, Aaron, Mary Johnson, Charlotte Scoville, Jenny Lenhoff, Nancy Hess, Bill Heath, and Terry Heath. Restore all to health and wholeness, and surround them with compassionate caregivers who remind them of your love, mercy, and never-failing presence. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord of the nations, during this election season in America, help us to remember that our hope is not in political candidates, parties, or philosophies. Our hope is in Jesus Christ alone. Grant us your wisdom and insight and help us to seek your will as we discern who you, who you would have us vote for. And whether our preferred candidates win or not, help us always to seek to love you, love all our neighbors as we love ourselves, and be prepared to give a gentle, reverent answer to those who ask us about the hope that we have through Jesus. Let us pray to the Lord. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. God's Word tells us that it is in hearing God's Word, receiving it in word and sacrament, that the gift of faith is created within us. In response to the Word and the faith that God has given to us, let's now join together to confess that faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We join together now and pray the prayer our Lord has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. 
The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Go in peace. Share the good news. Thanks be to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.